live air and welcome to the Cory Doctorow podcast. Um, it's Monday, August the 3rd, and it's an exciting day for me because it's my last day in London before we leave on our big trip to Canada. Uh, off tomorrow morning to uh, Toronto, dropping off the baby with uh, my folks, and then heading off to Montreal for the World Science Fiction Convention. And it's been a great weekend. We, uh, we have a new addition to our family. My brother and uh, his wife, uh, Tara and, and Neil, gave birth to a new little girl, Adelaide Heather Doctorow, uh, at the weekend. So Posey will have a new first cousin to play with when we get to Toronto as well. And we're off to Montreal for the World Science Fiction Convention, where I have a very busy schedule indeed. Um, I'm hoping to see many of you there. There's, there's lots going on, coffee clutch and the autographing and a, a morning walk and so on. There's also, of course, the Hugo Awards. These are the big ones. Um, this is my, I guess, my third nomination. And uh, I've never, I haven't won it yet. And so I've really got uh, my fingers crossed. Uh, if you follow this podcast, you'll know I'm up twice for um, the novel Little Brother and also for the short story novella uh, True Names, which I co-wrote with Benjamin Rosenbaum. So I'm very, very excited. Little Brother, I'll also be picking up two more awards for it while I'm there. Um, the Prometheus Award for Best Libertarian Novel and the Golden Duck Hal Clement Award for Best Young Adult Science Fiction Novel, which I'm sharing this year. Uh, So I've got a bunch of speeches to write today. Um, A bit of news that you might find interesting if you're enjoying this reading of Someone Comes to Town, Someone Leaves Town. A reader named David Wallace Jackson was taken by the notion that the characters in this book have their names randomly changed uh, with only the first letter of their name remaining constant through the course of the story. So he actually wrote a script that totally randomizes this process. If you go to craphound.com, you'll see right there at the top a link to David's script. And you can download the script, which is open source software, or just run it and and have a random edition of Someone Comes to Town, Someone Leaves Town generated whenever you want to. Um, I have a good day planned here for my last day in London. I uh, am seeing David Byrne tonight. He's my absolute favorite performer in the whole world, former frontman of Talking Heads. And uh, I may, in fact, be interviewing him for Boing Boing if they can get me a slot. And um, he's just a hero of mine. So, boy, wouldn't that be great. Uh, less good news well semi good news I continue to work on uh, For the Win and Chicken Little the uh, novel and short story that I've been working on for many many months and both of them are coming along neither of them are done uh, which I'm finding very frustrating indeed I really need to finish them up and neither of them want to end the way I want them to Uh, this is the kind of artistic torture that we uh, poor um, uh, sorry, poor tortured artists must must bear up. I've got my the back of my hand to my forehead. You can't see it over the podcast, so just take it as red. Anyway, enough of my whinging. Um, and uh, once again, I will bring you Someone Comes to Town, Someone Leaves Town. This is uh, installment 31 of this uh, reading of my 2005 novel. As he got closer to Kurt's storefront, he slowed down. The crowds were thick, laughing suburban kids and old men in buttoned-up cardigans and fishermen's caps and subcultural tropical fish of all kinds, goths and punks and six kinds of ravers and hippies and so forth. He spied Lank sitting on the steps leading up to one of the above-shop apartments, passing a cigarette to a little girl who sat between his knees. Link didn't see him. He was laughing at something the boy behind him said. Alan looked closer. It was Krishna, except he'd shaved his head and was wearing a hoodie with glittering piping run along the double seams, a kind of future sarcastic raver jumper that looked like it had been abandoned on the set of Space 1999. Krishna had his own little girl between his knees, with heart-shaped lips and thick matte concealer over her zits. His hand lay casually on her shoulder, and she brushed her cheek against it. Alan felt the air woof out of him, as though he'd been punched in the stomach, and he leaned against the side of a fruit market, flattening himself there. He turned his head from side to side, expecting to see Mimi, and wanting to rush out and shield her from the sight. But she was nowhere to be seen, and anyway, what business was it of his? And then he spied Natalie, standing at the other end of the street, holding on to the handles of one of the show bicycles out front of Bikes on Wheels. She was watching her brother closely, with narrowed eyes. It was her fault, in some way, or at least she thought it was. She'd caught him looking at internet porn and laughed at him, humiliating him, telling him that he should get out and find a girl whose last name wasn't JPEG. He saw that her hands were clenched into fists and realized his were too. 
It was her fault in some way, because she'd seen the kind of person he was hanging out with and hadn't done a thing about it. He moved into the crowd and waded through it, up the street on the opposite side from his neighbors. He closed in on Natalie and ended up right in front of her before she noticed he was there. Oh, she said and blushed hard. She had been growing out her hair for a couple of months, and it was long enough to clip a couple of barrettes to. With the hair, she looked less skinny, a little older, a little less vulnerable. She tugged a hank of it absently. Hi. We gonna do anything about that, he said, jerking his head toward the steps. Krishna had his hand on the little girl's top now, cupping her breast, then laughing when she slapped it away. She shrugged, bit her lip. She shook her head angrily. None of my business. None of your business. She looked at her feet. Look, there's a thing I've been meaning to tell you. I don't think I can keep on volunteering at the shop, okay? I've got stuff to do, assignments, and I'm taking some extra shifts at the store. He held up a hand. I'm grateful for all the work you've done, Natalie. You don't need to apologize. Okay, she said. She looked indecisively around, then seemed to make up her mind, and she hugged him hard. Take care of yourself, okay? It struck him as funny. I can take care of myself just fine. Don't worry about me for a second. You still looking for fashion work? I think Tropical will be hiring for the summer. I could put in that phone call. No, she said. No, that's okay. She looked over his shoulder and her eyes widened. He turned around and saw that Krishna and Link had spotted them, and that Krishna was whispering something in Link's ear that made Link grin nastily. I should go, she said. Krishna's hand was still down the little girl's top, and he jiggled her breast at Alan. The reporter had two lip piercings and a mass of close-cropped micro-dreads and an attitude. So here's what I don't get. You've got the market wired. Unwired, Kurt said, breaking in for the tenth time in as many minutes. Alan shot him a dirty look. Unwired, right. The kid made little inverted commas with his fingertips, miming, Yes, that is a very cute jargon you've invented, dork. You've got the market unwired, and you're going to connect up your network with the big interchange down on Front Street. Well, eventually, Alan said. The story was too complicated. Front Street, the market, open networks. It had no focus. It wasn't a complete narrative with a beginning, middle, and end. He tried to explain it to Mimi that morning over omelettes in his kitchen, and she'd been totally lost. Eventually, the kid took on a look of intense teenage skepticism. He claimed to be 20, but he looked about 17, and had been the puck in an intense game of eyeball hockey among the cute little punk girls who'd been volunteering in the shop front when he'd appeared. That's the end goal, a citywide network with all-we-can-eat free connectivity, fully anonymized and hardened against malicious attackers and incidental environmental interference. Alan steepled his fingers and tried to look serious and committed. Okay, that's the goal. But it's not going to be all or nothing. We want to make the community a part of the network. Getting people energized about participating in the network is as important as providing the network itself. Hell, the network is people. So we've got this intermediate step. This way everyone can pitch in. And that is what? Renaming your network to ParasiteNet? Kurt nodded vigorously. Exactly. And how will I find these parasite net nodes? Will there be a map or something with all this information on it? Alan nodded slowly. We've been thinking about a mapping application. But we decided that it was stupid, Kurt said. No one needed to draw a map of the web. It just grew and people found its weird corners on their own. Networks don't need centralized authority. That's just the chains on your mind talking. The chains on my mind? The kid snorted. Alan held up his hands placatingly. Wait a second, he said. Let's take a step back here and talk about values. The project here is about free expression and cooperation. Sure, it'd be nice to have a citywide network, but in my opinion, it's a lot more important to have a city full of people working on that network because they value expression and understand how cooperation gets us more of that. And we'll get this free expression how? By giving everyone internet access. The kid laughed and shook his head. That's a weird kind of free, if you don't mind my saying so. He flipped over his phone. I mean, it's like free speech if you can afford a $2,000 laptop and want to sit down and type on it. I can build you a desktop out of garbage for 20 bucks, Kurt said. We're drowning in PC parts. Sure, whatever. But what kind of free expression is that? Free expression so long as you're sitting at home with your PC plugged into the wall? 
Well, it's not like we're talking about displacing all the other kinds of expression, Alan said. This is in addition to all the ways that you've had to talk. Right, like this thing, the kid said. He reached into his pocket and took out a small phone. This was free, not $20, not even $2,000. Just free from the phone company in exchange for a one-year contract. Everyone's got one of these. I went trekking in India and you see people using them out in the bush. And you want to know what they use them for? Speech! Not speech in quotes meaning some kind of abstract expression, but actual talking. The kid leaned forward and planted his hands on his knees, and suddenly he was a lot harder to dismiss as some subculture-addled intern. He had that fiery intensity that Alan recognized from himself, from Kurt, from the people who believe. Alan thought he was getting an inkling into why this particular intern had responded to his press release. Not because he was too ignorant to see through the bullshit, but just the opposite. But that's communication through the phone company, Kurt said, wonderment in his voice that his fellow bohemian couldn't see how sucktastic that proposition was. How is that free speech? The kid rolled his eyes. Come off it. You old people, you turn up your noses whenever someone ten years younger than you points out that cell phones are actually a pretty good way for people to communicate with each other, even subversively. I wrote a term paper last year on this stuff. In Kenya, electoral scrutineers follow the ballot boxes from the polling place to the counting house and use their cell phones to sound the alarm when someone tries to screw with them. In Philippines, 20,000 people were mobilized in 15 minutes in front of the presidential palace when they tried to shut down the broadcasting of corruption hearings. And yet, every time someone from my generation talks about how important phones are to democracy, there's always some old peck sniff primly telling us that our phones don't give us real democracy. It is so much bullshit. He fell silent, and they all stared at each other for a moment. Kurt's mouth hung open. I'm not old, he said finally. You're older than me, the kid said. His tone softened. Look, I'm not trying to be cruel here, but you're generation blind. The internet is great, but it's not the last great thing we'll ever invent. My pops was a mainframe guy. He thought PCs were toys. You're a PC guy, so you think my phone is a toy. Alan looked off into the corner of the back room of Kurt's shop for a while, trying to marshal his thoughts. Back there, among the shelves of milk crates stuffed with t-shirts and cruft, he had a thought. Okay, he said, fair enough. It may be that today, in the field, there's a lot of free expression to be enabled with phones. But at the end of the day, he thought of Lyman, this is the phone company we're talking about. Big lumbering dinosaur that is thrashing in the tar pit. The spaz dinosaur that's so embarrassed all the other dinosaurs that none of them want to rescue it. Back in the 60s, these guys sued to make it illegal to plug anything other than their rental phones into the network. But more to the point, you get a different kind of freedom with an internet network than a phone company network, even if the internet network lives on top of the phone company's network. If you invent a new way of using the phone network, say, a cheaper way of making long-distance calls or using voice over IP, you can't roll that out on the phone network without the permission of the carrier. You have to go to him and say, hey, I've invented a way to kill your most profitable line of business. Can you install it at your switching station so that we can all talk long-distance for free? But on the net, anyone can invent any application that he can get his buddies to use. No central authority has to give permission for the web to exist. A physicist just hacked it together one day, distributed the software to his colleagues, and in a very short while, people all over the world had the web. So the net can live on top of the phone network, and it can run voice calling as an application, but it's not tied to the phone network. It doesn't care whose wires or wireless it lives on top of. It's got all these virtues that are key to free expression. That's why we care about this. The kid nodded as he talked, impatiently, signaling in body language that even Alan could read that he'd heard this all before. Yes, in this abstract sense, there are a bunch of things to like about your internet over there, but I'm talking about practical, non-abstract, non-theoretical stuff over here, the real world. I can get a phone for free. I can talk to everyone with it. I can say anything I want. I can use it anywhere. Sure, the phone company is a giant conspiracy by the man to keep us down, but can you really tell me with a straight face that because I can't invent the web for my phone or make free long-distance calls that I'm being censored? 
Of course not, Kurt said. Alan put a steadying hand on his shoulder. Fine, it's not an either-or thing. You can have your phones, I can have my internet. We'll both do our thing. It's not like the absence of the web for phones or high long-distance charges are good for free expression. Christ, we're trying to unbreak the net so that no one can own it or control it. We're trying to put it on every corner of the city for free, anonymously, for anyone to use. We're doing it with recycled garbage, and we're paying homeless teenagers enough money to get off the street as part of the program. What's not to fucking like? The kid scribbled hard on his pad. Now you're giving me some quotes I can use. You guys need to work on your pitch. What's not to fucking like? That's good. He and Link saw each other later that day, and Link still had his two little girls with him, sitting on the patio with the Greeks, drinking beers, and laughing at his jokes. Hey, you're the guy with the books, one of them said when he passed by. He stopped and nodded. That's me, all right, he said. Link picked at the label of his beer bottle and added to the dandruff of shredded paper in the ashtray before him. Hey, Abe, he said. Hey, Link, he said. He looked down at the little girl's bags. You made some fines, he said. Congratulations. They were wearing different clothes now, double-knit neon pop art dresses and horn rim shades and white legs flashing beneath the tabletop. They kicked their toes and smiled and drank their beers, which seemed comically large in their hands. Casually, he looked to see who was minding the counter at the Greeks and saw that it was the idiot son who wasn't smart enough to know that serving liquor to minors was asking for bad trouble. Where's Krishna? he asked. One girl compressed her heart-shaped lips into a thin line. And so she resolved to help her brother, because when it's your fault that something has turned to shit, you have to wash shit. And so she resolved to help her brother, which meant that, step one, she had to get him to stop screwing up. He took off, the girl said. Her pancake makeup had sweated away during the day, and her acne wasn't so bad that she'd needed it. He took off running, like he'd forgotten something important. He looked scared. Why don't you go get more beers, Link said angrily, cutting her off. And Alan had an intuition that Link had become Krishna's Renfield, a recursion of Renfields, each nesting inside the last like Russian dolls and reversed, big Link inside of medium Krishna inside the stump that remained of Daryl. And that meant that she had to take him out of the company of his bad companions, which she would accomplish through the simple expedient of scaring the everlasting fuck out of them. She sulked off, and the remaining girl looked down at her swinging toes. Where'd he go, Link? Alan said. If Krishna was in a hurry to go somewhere or see something, he had an idea of what it must be about. Link's expression closed up like a door slamming shut. I don't know, he said. How should I know? The other girl scuffed her toes and took a sip of her beer. Their gazes all flicked down to the bottle. The Greek would bar you for life if he knew you were bringing underage drinkers into here, Alan said. Plenty of other bars in the market, Link said, shrugging his newly broad shoulders elaborately. Trey was the kind of kid who'd known her brother since third grade and whose puberty-induced brain damage had turned him into an utter turd. She'd caught him once, going through the bathroom hamper, fetishizing her panties, and she shouted at him, and he just ducked and grinned, a little boy grin, that she had been incapable of wiping off his face, no matter how she raged. She would enjoy this. And they all know the Greek, Alan said. Three, two, one. He turned on his heel and began to walk away. Wait, Link called. The girl swallowed a giggle. He sounded desperate and not cool at all anymore. Alan stopped and turned his body halfway, looking impatiently over his shoulder. Link mumbled something. What? Behind Kurt's place, Link said. He was going to go look around behind Kurt's place. Thank you, Link, he said. He turned all the way around and got down to eye level with the other girl. Nice to meet you, he said. He wanted to tell her, be careful, or stay alert, or get out while the getting's good, but none of that seemed likely to make much of an impression on her. She smiled and her friend came back with three beers. You've got a great house, she said. Her friend said, yeah, it's amazing. Well, thank you, he said. Bye, they said. Link's gaze bored into the spot between his shoulder blades the whole way to the end of the block. Well, it's a short podcast today. Thank you very much. Not sure if I'll get to this on Monday. It will still be the Worldcon, and I will either be exhausted and tired from celebrating winning 
as many as two Hugo Awards, or exhausted and tired from uh, accepting the condolences for losing as many as two Hugo Awards, or some combination indeterminately thereof. Um, so uh, maybe not next Monday, but definitely the Monday after, bringing the headset to Toronto, so the next one may be from my parents' basement. Talk to you later. You've been listening to the Cory Doctor Podcast, licensed under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike US 3.0. Or as Woody Guthrie put it in another context, this song is copyrighted in the U.S. under seal of copyright 154085 for a period of 28 years, and anyone caught singing it without our permission will be a mighty good friend of ours, because we don't give a dern. Publish it, write it, sing it, swing to it, yodel it, we wrote it, that's all we wanted to do. Many thanks to John Taylor Williams for mastering. That's Rynex Studio, W-R-Y-N-E-C-K Studio at gmail.com. John Taylor Williams is a full-time self-employed audio engineer, producer, composer, and sound designer. In his free time, he makes beer, jewelry, odd musical instruments, and furniture. He likes to meditate, to read, and to cook. Talk to you next week.